As we continue our study of microorganisms, it is important to familiarize ourselves with the tools of the microbiology laboratory. Those tools include the microscope, various stains, media, and various culturing techniques. The focus of this course will be on those techniques used in the clinical laboratory. It all starts with a specimen. First, you must collect the specimen, and there are a variety of ways to collect a clinical specimen. Swabs, the aspiration of fluid, or the collection of naturally eliminated body fluids. But you have to remember, the result of the culture is only as good as the specimen. To process the specimen, we have to consider the five eyes of specimen processing. We start with inoculation. This is putting the organism on the right media with the proper nutrients. Then we have to incubate the specimen. This means we have to put it at the right temperature and in the right atmosphere. As we're inoculating the specimen, we want to use techniques that give us isolated colonies. It's important that we get isolated colonies. Isolated colonies are believed to be from a single microorganism, and so an isolated colony represents a pure culture. Once something is grown, we need to inspect that thing, and we can do this both microscopically and macroscopically. And finally, we have to do the processes to identify the organism. We start out with that inoculation or cultivation process. The inoculum is the sample to be cultured. An inoculation is the process of introducing the inoculum to a collection of nutrients. That collection of nutrients is the media that we're going to use. Now there are a number of media we can use to identify organisms or to grow organisms. It depends upon the organism and the specimen as to which is the most appropriate to use. Media is going to provide the nutrients for the microorganisms. We must be sure we meet the nutritional needs of the organism. Media can be classified based on its physical state, its chemical composition, or its functional type. As we look at the physical states of media, it can be either liquid or solid. Media that is liquid is referred to as a broth. Media that is solid is referred to as auger. Now, auger is solid because it has a solidifying agent in it known as auger auger. Auger auger is an extract of seaweed that has the ability to melt at 100 degrees centigrade and solidify at 42 degrees centigrade. Since most of the things we incubate, we want to incubate it at about 35 degrees centigrade, we have no problem with the auger melting and becoming liquid. Many broths are converted to augers simply by the addition of auger auger to solidify them. Auger can be poured into plates, in which case you have an auger plate, or auger can be poured into test tubes. Now these test tubes are then allowed to solidify on a slant. This provides a surface in the test tube called a slant that is available to grow microorganisms. Semi-solid auger will have half the auger content. It won't pour like a broth, but it also won't hold a slant like auger. We primarily use semi-solid auger when we're exploring motility. Some media cannot be liquefied, and some things that we use as media you would not consider media, but sterile rice grains and sterile potato slices can be used as media. Media can be classified based on its chemical composition. Chemically defined or synthetic media has a very exact recipe. This means that the media will be the same every single time it is made. Physiological saline is a good example of this. You put 9 tenths of a gram of sodium chloride into 100 milliliters of water and you have 9 tenths percent sodium chloride. You do that every single time, you get the same thing every single time. That is chemically defined. Complex media has at least one ingredient in it that varies from batch to batch. Usually the ingredient comes from an organism so that there is some variation depending on which organism you get it from. These nutrients provide complex growth factors that are required for many organisms to grow. Most media that we use in the clinical laboratory is complex. We can also define media based on how it functions. General purpose media grows a broad spectrum of microorganisms. It is a complex or non-synthetic media. Nutrient auger is a good example. Pretty much everything grows on nutrient auger. 
Enriched media is another functional type of media. Enriched media has special ingredients that provide special nutrition for certain organisms that we call fastidious organisms. Fastidious organisms are picky eaters. They need something special in their diet or they won't grow. Blood auger and chocolate auger are a couple of examples of enriched media. Blood or the laked blood and chocolate auger provide heme or proteins or certain things that some organisms need to grow. And here is blood auger with some organisms growing on it. These organisms would not grow on nutrient auger. Selective media has some ingredient in it that favors the growth of one organism or inhibits the growth of a group of organisms. High salt broth, McConkey auger, and Sabra dextrose auger are some examples. Here you see the same specimen planted on two different types of auger. Nutrient auger, which is just a general auger that grows pretty much everything, and the Sabra dextrose auger. Sabra dextrose auger is selective. It has a very low pH and a very high sugar content, which discourages the growth of bacteria. So Sabra dextrose auger selects for fungus. And here you see the molds that are growing here rather abundantly that were overgrown over here by the bacteria. McConkie's auger also acts as a selective auger. It will select for gram-negative organisms. So E. coli was planted here and it grows well, but Staphylococcus aureus, which is a gram-positive organism, will not grow on McConkie auger. Differential media will grow several types of organisms, but the microbes that grow on it will give different colonial morphology. This will allow us to put them into categories or to differentiate them in somehow. Blood auger and McConkie's auger, we've already talked about as being an enriched auger and a selective auger, can also be differential media. Tinsdale's media is an example of a differential media as well. Media can fall into several categories, and this can sometimes be a little confusing. Blood auger, as well as being an enrichment auger that allows special organisms to grow on it, also acts as a differential media because the blood in it allows for different hemolytic patterns. So you have beta hemolysis, alpha hemolysis, and gamma hemolysis, or no hemolysis. This, again, allows you to categorize organisms so that you have something you can select from. McConkie's auger only grows gram-negative organisms, but there is lactose in it, and those organisms that can utilize lactose will turn purple, they'll grow purple colonies, and those that can't utilize lactose will have these colorless colonies. So it's a differential media because you either get a difference between lactose-using or non-lactose-using organism. Tinsdale's media is a media that differentiates for those organisms that cause diphtheria. Tinsdale's media has telluride in it. Organisms that cause diphtheria pick up the telluride and grow as brown or black colonies. No other organism will do this. If you suspect you have diphtheria and you put the specimen on Tinsdale's media, those black or brown colonies are the ones you would want to work with. Some organisms will not grow on artificial media, but they may grow in living cells, so we may use cell cultures. This is particularly true when we are culturing viruses. We also have some very special media. All of the media that we use to identify microorganisms are classified as special media because they have a special purpose. We also have transport media. Transport media will be found in culturette swabs. It doesn't support the growth of the organism, but it helps maintain the organism while it's in transit from the bedside to the lab. Anaerobic media is similar. It helps maintain the organism, an anaerobic organism, as it is transferred from the specimen to the culturing area. We have a need to work with pure cultures, and so we need to use techniques that separate one cell from all of the others. We take our basic specimen, and we want to make sure we can separate all the cells out so we get isolated colonies of everything. There are basically three isolation techniques used in the clinical laboratory. Streak plates, pour plates, or spread plates. The streak plate involves taking the inoculum and spreading it around on the surface of the auger. 
you usually sterilize your loop in between here. The idea being that as you spread this around, you are separating those organisms out and you eventually get individual cells that will grow into isolated colonies. The pore plate is used if you're interested in how many organisms are in something. Typically, serial dilutions are made of the initial sample, and we typically use 1 to 10 dilutions because the math is just easier that way. A small portion of a, the dilution will be placed in liquid auger, and that auger will be mixed and poured into a plate and allowed to solidify. All of the organisms, all of the individual colonies you get, are called colony forming units, and they represent one organism. If you get a small enough number of organisms, then you can count them, multiply back by the dilution factor, and determine how many organisms were in the initial sample. The disadvantage to the pore plate is that some of your colonies are embedded in the auger and you can't get to them to work with. The spread plate is also a way to quantify something. Here a specified amount of inoculum is placed on the media surface and then a bent glass rod called a hockey stick is used to spread the inoculum uniformly over the surface of the plate. Because you can inoculate a specific amount of the inoculum, say a hundredth or a thousandth of a milliliter, and spread that over the surface of the plate, when you can count the colonies on the surface, then you can multiply by however much you planted. This is commonly used in the clinical lab for urine cultures. There's a special loop that will put one thousandth of a milliliter on the surface of the plate. The hockey stick then spreads the inoculum around on the plate and we allow it to grow. For bacterial growth to be clinically significant in a urine culture, you have to grow at least 100,000 colonies per milliliter. Since you planted a thousandth of a milliliter, if you get 100 or more colonies growing on the surface of the plate, you have met that standard. The advantage of the spread plate over the pore plate is that all of the colonies are on the surface of the plate and you can get to them easily for identification techniques. Incubation is placing the cultures in a controlled atmosphere. Both the temperature and the atmosphere itself need to be controlled. So an incubator typically has a controlled temperature and sometimes we have to provide the organism with a special atmosphere. Once we've grown something, we're ready to inspect it. Macroscopic inspection starts with looking at the colonial morphology. Now you always want to pick isolated colonies because that's your pure culture, that's your single organism. Most clinical specimens are mixed cultures. There is more than one thing typically growing there and you'll have to look at all the different isolated colonies. Mixed cultures typically have the ability of being separated out. We can separate those organisms out by using various culturing techniques. We always want to avoid adding contaminants to any specimen. Contaminants are unwanted organisms from the environment. They have nothing to do with the clinical specimen. And so aseptic technique is used from the time we collect the specimen through all of the processing of the specimen to make sure that we're only working with the organisms in the clinical specimen and not something that wandered in from the environment. Here you see isolated colonies on this plate. These are the ones we would want to work with and describe. This is really two colonies grown together. This is really two colonies grown together. So even though all of these look alike, we would only work with individual isolated colonies. Inspection may also be microscopic in nature. Now there are two different preparations that can be used to look at specimens microscopically. One is the wet mount. The wet mount is very easy to do. You simply mix a little of the specimen in some water, add a cover slip, and look at it. The advantage is you can do this very quickly, but there are some disadvantages. Wet mounts are not permanent. It's also challenging to stain wet mounts, so sometimes there's not much contrast. It's hard to see things. Smears are much easier to work with. A smear is made by placing some of the organism on a slide and allowing it to dry there, and then you can stain it. That's going to help with visualization. Smears are also pretty permanent, so they're around for a while for you to look at. Different staining techniques can be used on smears to give you different information about your organism. Microbes are very, very small. Bacteria are measured in micrometers, 
viruses are measured in nanometers. Metric measurements are used in science, and in the metric system, the basic units are the meter, the liter, and the gram. Now in microbiology, we're only interested in the smallest of the units. If we put centi in front of something, then we've got one hundredth of that thing. So a centimeter is one hundredth of a meter. If we put milli in front of it, then a millimeter is one thousandth of a meter, or ten to the minus three. Micro, micrometer, we're putting ten to the minus six there. This is a very, very, very small amount and a nanometer is a thousand times smaller at 10 to the minus 9. Now in order to visualize this, think of a yardstick. A yardstick is about a meter long. It's a little shorter than a meter. If you were to divide that yardstick into 10 equal pieces and then take one of those pieces and divide it into 10 equal pieces, one of those pieces would be a centimeter. Now take that centimeter, divide it into 10 equal pieces. One of those pieces is a millimeter. Now hold on to that thought, a millimeter. Divide that into 10 equal pieces. Divide one of those into 10 equal pieces. Divide one of those into 10 equal pieces. One of those pieces is a micrometer. Take that micrometer, I'm sure you have a firm picture of that in your mind, and divide the micrometer into 10 equal pieces. Divide one of those pieces into 10 equal pieces, and divide one of those pieces into 10 equal pieces. One of those final pieces is a nanometer. So you can see these are too small for you to imagine. Microscopy depends upon the use of light or electrons to magnify objects. Light and electrons are part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Magnification, wavelength of the radiation used, resolution, and contrast are all things that have to be taken into consideration for microscopy to work. Magnification is increasing the size of an object, or apparently increasing its size. We use the X at the end of the number to tell us how many times something has been magnified. So if we say something has been magnified 100 X, it's been magnified 100 times. To increase magnification, you can use multiple lenses. The more lenses you use, ideally, the greater the magnification. But there's a point at which you get big images, but they're faint and they're unclear. This is called empty magnification. We use radiation as our visualizing tool in microscopy. Now radiation travels in waves. We use parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is everything from x-rays, light, radio, and microwaves. Because radiation does travel in waves, it travels in all directions from whatever its source is. The wavelength is the distance from peak to peak of the waves. So here we see the electromagnetic spectrum, and here are the waves. Shorter wavelengths have a smaller distance between the peaks of the waves. Longer wavelengths, we have more distance between the peaks. Notice that the part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can see, the visible light, is a really just a very small piece of the whole spectrum. And notice that blue-purple light is the shortest wavelength and red light is the longest wavelength. Resolution, or resolving power, is the ability to look at something and tell that it's two separate objects. Basically, it's the distance two objects can be together and you can still see them as two distinct objects. With modern microscopes, if they're as far apart as two-tenths of a micrometer, we can typically identify them as two individual objects. Closer together than that, and they may look like one big fuzzy thing. Resolution is dependent on the wavelength of the light being used, the wavelength of the radiation being used, and the numerical aperture of the lens. The numerical aperture of the lens is the lens's ability to gather light. Now this is set when the lens is manufactured, so we can't do anything about that, but we can increase resolving power by working with the wavelength. The shorter the wavelength, the better the resolution. You'll remember that visible light, that short wavelength is in the purple-blue end, and if you look at the microscopes you use in lab, you will see that there's a blue filter over that light source. That gives you the shortest wavelength of light to give you the best resolution.
Contrast is the difference in intensity between two objects. And this is an important factor in determining resolution as well. If two things are very similar in color, it's very hard to tell them apart. For example, a polar bear in a snowstorm, as opposed to a grizzly bear in a snowstorm, would give you two different kinds of contrast. That polar bear would be kind of hard to see. The grizzly bear would be much easier to see because of the contrast. Most microorganisms are colorless, so we use staining techniques to give them some color and improve their contrast. The other thing we can do is get light out of phase. Our eyes can actually tell if those wavelengths of light do not hit our eye at the same time. If we can change the phasing of the light, that is take some of the light out of sync with its wavelength, we'll actually see differences. There are basically five types of microscopes. The bright field microscope is the most common. It's called the bright field microscope because when you look through the ocular, the circle that you see is a lighted circle and the object you will look at will be dark against that lighted circle. The dark field microscopy will have a dark field, but the object you're looking at will be light. The phase microscope will play tricks with the light to help you see things better. The fluorescent microscope will use a special kind of staining so that you can use ultraviolet light. There is a special kind of fluorescent microscope called the confocal microscope. And then the electron microscope will use electrons as the magnifying radiation. And there are different kinds of electron microscopes. We have the scanning electron microscope, the transmission electron microscope, and the probe electron microscope.